Well, thank you. My name is Trevor Harrison. I am uh, director of Parkland Institute, and it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, kick off the uh, last session, uh, last presentation of the 21st annual conference of Parkland Institute. I want to thank all of you again who have uh, come out today and throughout the, uh, the last couple of days. I think you'll agree with me that this has been, again, a just fabulous, fabulous uh, conference. Want to thank uh, certainly all of the presenters. Uh, you know, I, I, we just get better and better every year. I think you know. So, uh, I do have a number of uh, other very specific thank yous I want to make here. First of all, to uh, our conference sponsors, the Alberta Federation of Labor, Athabasca University, <laughs> Canadian Union of Public Employees. Oh, once again, we have a competition here. Okay. Civic Service Union Local 52, Health Sciences Association of Alberta. Okay, they win so far. Okay, Non-Academic uh, Staff Association U of A, United Nurses of Alberta, <laughs> University of Alberta's Faculty of Arts, and the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Endowment. Also want to thank our media sponsors for their generous support, Alberta Views Magazine, View Weekly, The TIE, and CJSR Radio Edmonton. A big thanks to a, very, uh, a few small businesses that have really helped us out over the last few days. First to Earth's General Store for their freshly roasted, uh, freshly roasted, freshly ground fair trade coffee and other fair trade products that we served over the weekend to Bonton Bakery for the fabulous pastries, I can attest to that, and the Upper Crust for catering our lunch yesterday. <laughs> Most importantly, thanks to the many volunteers who've made this conference so successful. We couldn't do it, uh, the conference, every year without those volunteers. They're just a fabulous bunch, as I'm sure you'll all have recognized. Thank you. We had, in fact, over 30 volunteers this year who helped make this conference happen. This includes the conference steering committee, the facilitators, and all the volunteers who have been around the conference making everything work. And again, Parkland can't thank you enough. Special thanks to Mark Copen for ensuring that we get both audio and video recordings of the conference for our website. And I hope you'll go there afterwards if you've missed anything to, to take that in. To Rob Butts for all his effort in keeping our conference website operational and online. And to Flavia Rojas for all the conference design work, in, including that fabulous uh, pamphlet this year. That was just one of the great uh, uh, images I've seen in a long time. And for all those who didn't ha don't have time to, to name thank you, I'd now like to especially uh, ask all the volunteers here to stand and be recognized. Any volunteers, please, please. You are great people. Thank you. Thank you. One of the uh, largest thank, thank yous I want to give, as always, needs to go to the incredibly able and dedicated staff for all their hard work in making sure the conference happens smoothly. Uh, I am very fortunate as uh, director of the Institute to uh, have uh, surrounding me some of the most amazing people and just a joy to work with all the time. Gail Davey for our programming and development uh, coordinator for, uh, has only been on the job since July, so this is a baptism by fire, but Gail has come through uh, wonderfully. Um, uh, the uh, Scott Harris, our communications coordinator, who has coordinated our web presence and communications around the conference. Scott, where are you as well? Scott's here, he's probably out in the foyer still. Uh, Charlene Oliver, uh, Charlene again, all of you I think know, our administrative uh, coordinator for keeping track of all the registrations, ticket sales, money, et cetera, et cetera, and helping out wherever uh, she was needed over the last while. Uh, special thanks here also to Katie Doran. Is Katie present here? Yay! Uh, just a few last announcements here, and then uh, you won't have to put up with me anymore. 
Uh, please remember that Parkland receives no corporate, foundation, or government funding. Events like this one are only possible because of the generous donations we receive from individuals like you and the organizations you belong to. If you haven't filled out your pledge form yet, please consider doing so. Uh, also, please drop off your name tags in the box outside the door. Uh, we reuse the holders. Also, one last reminder to please fill out the uh, evaluations for the conference. Uh, we take these very, very seriously. In a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be going over uh, thinking about the conference, how we can improve it, what worked, what didn't work. Your evaluations mean a lot to us, so please uh, take the time to do that. With no more ado, I want to introduce our final speaker uh, for this weekend, uh, Dr. Jamie Peck. Jamie Peck is a Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy, Distinguished University Scholar and Professor of Geography at the University of British Columbia. With long-term research interests in urban restructuring, geographical political economy, labor studies, the politics of policy formation and mobility, and economic geography. His current research is focused on the financial restructuring of US cities, the politics of contingent labor, and the political economy of neoliberalizing. His recent books include Offshore, Exploring the Worlds of Global Outsourcing, Fast Policy, Experimental Statecraft at the Thresholds of Neoliberalism, Constructions of Neoliberal Reason, and the Wiley Blackwell Companion in Economic Geography. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and previously the holder of Guggenheim and Harkness Fellowships, Peck is the editor-in-chief of the Environment and Planning series of journals. Again, uh, thank you, Jamie, for being here today, and I welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, just working. Thank you, Trevor, for the uh, introduction. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that we meet here on uh, Treaty 6 territory and to uh, recognize the warm welcome that we've received uh, and all the work of the Parkland Institute and uh, volunteers, especially Gail, who uh, has been in contact with the speakers for, for many weeks and has been a great help. So it's great to be here and I've very much enjoyed uh, the meeting. Um, and I, I'm glad that you're here as the hardcore on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so just to remind you, it's Sunday afternoon. You're here listening to a geography teacher talking about social theory and uh, esoteric uh, matters of that ilk. Uh, so that reflects a certain kind of commitment which I want to uh, acknowledge at this point. Uh, my uh, message here is to, to make the case that how we think about neoliberalism um, uh, and how it might be surpassed and, uh, and defeated begs the question of how it currently exists, where it lives, uh, uh, how it is interdigitated with other sources of social power and, uh, and corporate and state power. So we have to think about the nature of neoliberalism if we're to really to address the question of how it might ultimately fail or eventually be uh, superseded. So in this way, in this sense, how we think about or conceptualize uh, neoliberalism conditions the way, uh, the ways that we think about what we can do uh, about it. Now, I'm not one of those who says that we should do away with the term because it's a loose and sloppy uh, academic term, although it is extremely problematic to use in a precise uh, manner. It's promiscuous. Uh, it, tends to invoke overbearing forces which can be politically disabling. Uh, it's capacious and baggy as a term, seems to mean different things to different people. Um, but I think it's actually politically important to name it and to, res to wrestle with it as a sort of rascal uh, concept and difficult idea because it occupies a space that we need for various reasons uh, to address. So in answer to the question that I've set myself, uh, is neoliberalism uh, dead or alive? Uh, it's both uh, will be my answer. I want to suggest that it is both uh, dead and alive. Uh, it exists in a kind of undead uh, state. <laughs> so this also is important to recognize that because neoliberalism isn't this clear cut, unambiguous category, um, it's not something that we can uh, easily apply as a label uh, to politicians, countries, 
eras and so forth. It exists in shades of gray and uh, it surrounds and infects and complicates our politics in ways that uh, are important uh, to recognize. So the fact that neoliberalism is often used either as a kind of radical slogan or a reference to some background condition that we don't really address explicitly uh, is the kind of problem that I'm going to wrestle with. Uh, somewhat uh, theoretically, I have to confess, uh, but hopefully uh, ways that will be uh, at least somewhat uh, helpful. So I want to kind of problematize, if you like, the nature of the beast uh, and to think explicitly about what neoliberalism is, what it does, where it lives. One of the things I want to uh, recognize at the start uh, is that we all see neoliberalism from different uh, places. Um, I'm one of the generation of uh, British school children who encountered Margaret Thatcher uh, when she became Secretary of State uh, for Education uh, in the early 1970s. And her first act was to uh, abolish free school milk, uh, which had been provided free in, in British schools since 1944. Um, so, you may have heard this uh, reference to this in some of the historical treatments of Thatcherism. Uh, the playground chant, Maggie Thatcher, Milk Snatcher, was one that I uh, imagined myself uh, singing uh, as a seven-year-old schoolboy. And uh, that's really when my struggle against neoliberalism uh, really began. Uh, so for good or ill, I've been at this for a long, long time. Uh, Initially, uh, I have to say it was much more of a visceral uh, feeling about the nature of the Thatcherite project. Uh, but uh, once I became a graduate student uh, in the 1980s, I started to work on these questions uh, with a bit more sort of analytical uh, focus. Uh, but I want to say that at the time, this is uh, when I was a grad student, this is back in the mid 1980s, it was clear even then that Thatcherism, as we called it at the time, uh, was both uh, a deeply contradictory but also potentially transformative project. It felt like you were in the midst of a really radical break of some kind. We had the coal miners' strike, many other sort of epic struggles during the 1980s, the abolition of the Greater London Council, uh, remarkable political events that were really uh, uh, major moments in British uh, and perhaps wider uh, political history. And what was clear about Thatcherism at the time was that it was a deeply reactionary credo. It was about dismantling uh, much of the post-war social settlement that was alien to the new breed of conservative politicians. Uh, it was about attacking labor unions. It was about uh, eroding the social state, not the state as a whole. Harsha made that point extremely well last night. And neoliberalism isn't a, it's an ideology that talks about the small state, but it doesn't typically produce a small state. It's about what the state does. So Thatcherism was clearly about rolling back certain parts of the social state and rolling out uh, a different kinds of state, uh, a more militarized uh, uh, police state in some respects. And so Pierre Bourdieu famously talked about the state of having a, a right and a left arm. Uh, the left arm of the state deals with the social caring functions of the state. The right deals with oppression, control, discipline, and so on. And the neoliberal state has a muscular right arm and a withering left arm. Uh, but it may weigh the same. Uh, it, it, as a share of GDP, it could still be a similar uh, kind of size. Uh, so neoliberalism wasn't simply about uh, a smaller state. It was about the transformation of the state and what the state was going to be used to do. Uh, and it was fairly clear, I think, even back in the 1980s, uh, that there were big changes uh, underway. Now, it's um, unwise generally to uh, quote oneself, and I try to avoid this, uh, but I want to do this to make a particular point now. Uh, let me just read this out from, uh, from a paper of mine. The apparent strength of neoliberalism has come about not because it provides a potential regulatory fix, but, but on the contrary, because it represents the politics of the unresolved crisis. The path defined by neoliberalism is one that leads off the precipice. Uh, that was, I wrote that uh, nearly 25 years ago, 
Um, and so I, I'm one of the people that's predicted the death of neoliberalism more often than probably most of you in this room. Uh, and so I want to reflect on that sobering fact. Uh, to quote uh, George Bush, uh, as I occasionally will do, uh, my colleague and I, Adam Tickell here, misunderestimated neoliberalism. Uh, we mi misunderestimated it in a whole series of ways 25 years ago. We misunderestimated its adaptive, shape-shifting, double-speaking uh, capacities. Uh, we misunderestimated its political and cultural promiscuity. Uh, we misunderestimated its facility for cohabiting as with all kinds of different political projects, as well as a capacity for continuous renewal. Uh, not least uh, through crisis itself. So in, in response to the provocation that is the, uh, titles, the title of the conference, I will say that yes, neoliberalism is in crisis, uh, but also it's always been in crisis. Uh, it's a creature of crisis, and uh, that's partly the way in which we need to think about how it operates. In fact, because neoliberalism inhabits crisis conditions, it also propagates crises, uh, and it's, that's one of the reasons it's been able to outlive and outcompete uh, its ideological and political adversaries. It thrives often uh, in crises. So these are the three things that I want to uh, cover in the, the, the time that I've got with you uh, today. I'll start with underscoring the point that all of our readings of neoliberalism are situational. They reflect from where we see it and how we encounter it. Uh, at the same time, we should recognize there's no privileged center from which we understand the neoliberal project. Neoliberalism in its far fled, far-fetched, uh, far uh, widely distributed forms today isn't simply a version of the Thatcherism we saw in Britain in the early 1980s. It's not all varieties of that. Uh, it exists in many different kinds of species. So we need to recognize then that neoliberalism as this baggy, loose category is a multifaceted and polycentric uh, phenomenon. We can't really get by with a simplified one-line definition of what it is, and that's one of the reasons that I'm standing here talking about the definition of neoliberalism 25 years later uh, than uh, after much work on this topic. It still uh, makes it difficult to define because uh, it constantly shapes uh, it shif and shifts. So since the uh, 1980s, I've been exploring uh, how neoliberalism's geography and its variegated forms uh, allow us to understand the nature of the project more widely. And I'm going to develop two themes in the talk today. Firstly, um, to do my duty as a geographer, to ask us to think spatially about what neoliberalism is, think about its spatiality, as we say uh, in my field, and use that as a way to understand uh, its nature. And I'll show you some uh, rather unsophisticated maps uh, to make that point. Secondly, uh, we need to think about neoliberalism in relational terms, how it relates uh, to other things, how it lives amongst its others. Um, because, I'm going to suggest, neoliberalism cannot live on its own. It's actually a parasitical project. It grafts itself on to other living social organisms. It cannot exist on its own. Uh, and that's an extremely important aspect of the way that it exists in the world. It's a parasite which, in a sense, has taken over the host organism. Uh, and that's the kind of dilemma politically and in other ways we face uh, at the present time. So when we think about how it might be transcended, uh, we have to recognize that complex uh, nature of its existence. It's interwoven with and enabled by other sources of power, state power, corporate power, racial oppression, and so on. It's tangled with all of those things. It doesn't exist neatly separate from them. So how we think about neoliberalism then is partly a question about how we think about its complex relations and connections with other things. So let me start off by talking about where neoliberalism uh, is. Uh, if we're to look at the use of neoliberalism in the social sciences, uh, uh, there's a rather striking uh, pattern here. This is used as of it in the social science literature as a keyword since uh, 1980. 
What's clear here is it's a relatively new term for social scientists. Uh, it actually emerged as a kind of, after the first wave of talk about globalization in the early uh, 1990s, when globalization was supposed to be about the end of history, even the end of geography, a, a, a victory of free market capitalism over its historic foes, that first version of globalization talk was partly critiqued by people saying, no, this is actually a political project. It's not like the end of history. Um, uh, one of the, so the, one of the first ways in which this was invoked was to correct those apolitical accounts of globalization in the 1990s. Uh, and it later would become a slogan of oppositional movements, but not until uh, the sort of millennial period. Uh, and this is an, a line from Perry Anderson where he reflected on its meaning uh, in 2000. What's the principal aspect of the 1990s, he asked in New Left Review. Put briefly, it can be defined as the virtually uncontested consolidation and universal diffusion of neoliberalism. Now, there's much to admire about Perry Anderson, but I think that is not a particularly helpful way of thinking about uh, the rise and ascendancy of neoliberalism as an uncontested, uh, globally diffuse uh, project. So it became a kind of signifier of the zeitgeist after 2000, and that's how it's been used in the literature as a kind of background uh, signifier, a signifier of the times uh, in which uh, we live. You'll also note here there was a surge in its use after the Wall Street crash of 2008, where it's again acquired uh, as another uh, set of uh, resonances. I also note here, uh, if you can see the uh, red bars at the bottom, uh, they're articles about neoliberalism written by geographers. Um, and best I can tell, geographers aren't about 50% of all of the social sciences. Uh, so for some reason, geographers were on the scene early talking about neoliberalism. Uh, we could talk about why that is. Um, I would say uh, it's partly because many of us in the field of geography work on what we call the restructuring present. Uh, we very much focus on dynamics of uh, political, economic, and social change uh, as it's happening in real time. And we always try to connect local phenomena with wider, more than local concepts. And so geographers have been reaching for these forms of explanation for a long time, while recognizing that it's not a blanket condition. Uh, so in my field, uh, we've been grappling with this for quite a long time. If we're to look at some of the uses of neoliberalism now, uh, they are extremely uh, widespread. Some use it uh, to refer to a policy uh, package um, labor market deregulation, free trade, uh, a recognizable set of policies. Others use it to refer to free market ideology uh, more generally. Sometimes it's invoked to uh, refer to the pervasive culture of competitive individualism. Or that for others, it's a byword for globalization. It's kind of interchangeable uh, with that. Or a byword for corporate rule can mean that. Some people would use it as a synonym for marketization, commodification, privatization. It's just interchangeable with those terms, even though it's quite different in many respects. For others, it refers to the Washington Consensus. But just think about the situated nature of that word. I often say if you were, if you were to walk down the street in Santiago or Johannesburg, you could probably get speak to somebody there and get a decent definition of what the Washington consensus was from there. If you walk down the street in Washington, D.C. and ask somebody, you would not be able to get any kind of answer to that question. So in some respects, neoliberalism is seen more clearly from the outside than from the in, uh, from the inside. Uh, but that's just one of the illustrations in which this is a situated uh, term. It's often applied to the structural adjustment programs used by the Washington consensus agencies like the IMF and the World Bank, especially in Africa and Latin America. It's used also as a synonym for shock treatment, as applies in Eastern Europe, especially uh, during the 1990s. There are some, like the economic historian Philip Morofsky, that talk about neoliberalism as a thought collective, uh, going back to Friedrich Hayek and uh, the think tanks that were established uh, starting in the uh, 1970s uh, that have propagated uh, the free market or neoliberal project. Some 
would reduce it to the Chicago School of Economics or even neoclassical economics more generally. Others trace it to Hayek himself and his own writings. Uh, Foucauldians will talk about neoliberalism as a form of subjectivity that hails certain forms of behavior and governs uh, conduct. Activists will often use it as an oppositional slogan, as just a, a, a way of uh, categorizing what they're against. Uh, the World Social Forum does that. Uh, snide critics will point out uh, that it's a sort of secret handshake of the left. This is a term that is only really used by critics. Uh, neoliberals themselves don't tend to apply the term to what they do. Uh, and so it's a kind of little nod that we are fellow lefties and we kind of know uh, what's really going on here. Um, in lots of respects, it's just a catch-all concept for everything that we don't like uh, that's currently going on in the world, uh, that we just say, ah, neoliberalism. And my kids have even uh, adopted this because they've known that I've sort of talked about this ever since uh, they've been in the house. And uh, whenever something happens, they'll look at me and say, ah, neoliberalism again, Dad, you know. So <laughs> it, it more or less more or less apparently explains everything. Uh, and then, as a result, possibly explains absolutely nothing at all. So you know, we've got to be careful what it does signify. Uh, this is what I'm suggesting. Now, one of the ways of thinking about neoliberalism that has been uh, quite popular in my own field is to think about it as an actually existing form, especially once it started to merge with uh, state power after the 1970s in a series of actually existing neoliberal political uh, programs. Now, I'm about to show you one of my sophisticated maps here, so uh, uh, buckle up. Uh, this is what uh, neoliberalism looked like uh, circa late 1970s, uh, early uh, 1980s. Uh, it's crude, but it, hopefully it makes at least one point. Uh, that there were a series of neoliberal, actually existing neoliberal projects uh, that was at least named that way by critics or referred to themselves to, somewhat, to some degree in these terms in different parts of the world by this relatively early period in its uh, actual history. Uh, Santiago, Chile uh, was one of the centers. We got Auckland and Wellington in New Zealand, uh, the project in London led by the Thatcherites, and the American version, of course, articulated between Washington DC, uh, New York, and Chicago. And it exhibited some recurrent features uh, and network connections across these uh, very different sites. But let's face it, these neoliberal projects were growing in extremely different soils in these, uh, these four places. Uh, Chile is a reminder that neoliberalism and authoritarianism often have lived together. Uh, so we shouldn't be so surprised uh, that we've seen very, various forms of authoritarianism matched with neoliberalism today. And in some respects, its original form uh, was an anti-democratic uh, uh, form in Chile in the early 1970s. Uh, the Chicago boys' infamous connections to Chile and to Pinochet um, were forged as early as the 1950s, uh, when the Ford Foundation started to uh, finance the movement of economists trained in Chicago uh, back and forth to Chile. These are extremely deep roots. If we look at the Reagan story, uh, the Reagan's uh, version of neoliberalism, uh, the Reagan uh, coalition was a complex coalition of small staters, uh, security hawks, the Christian right, um, Reagan Democrats, and so on. And this had deep roots into Cold War politics in the United States, uh, the Barry Water, Goldwater campaigns of the, uh, the early 1960s, uh, the Southern strategy uh, pursued by Nixon and, and those around him, suburban tax revolts in California. Uh, again, very different routes to the uh, Chilean situation. If we were to look at the London situation and Thatcherism, there, the ascendancy of neoliberalism was propelled by quite different uh, political and social forces in the nation of shopkeepers, which in some respects Thatcher herself epitomized. The multiple crises of the 1970s, the IMF bailout of the UK economy in the mid-1970s, the fall of the Ted Heath government that galvanized the right of the Conservative Party uh, 
following a defeat by the coal miners and a determination to, to uh, get revenge on the National Union of Coal Miners. Um, the three-day week, the chaos of the 1970s in the UK, that was part of the story of Thatcher's uh, ascendancy. So these early neoliberal projects then came out of very different histories, even though they had some connections between them, and you could see echoes across these different projects. But what the neoliberal reformers started to do in these different places varied importantly in, in, con in relation to the context in which they operated. So Reagan didn't have to fight the coal miners. Reagan didn't have large nationalized industries to privatize and to live off the receipts of those industries as Margaret Thatcher did. So the technologies of privatization were pioneered in the UK because there was large segments of the economy to privatize, uh, which didn't exist in the same way in the United States. So each of these projects is contextual then. So what does it look like now? Well, uh, we're inclined to believe that there's now more or less blanket coverage, that it's hard to go anywhere not to find some traces of neoliberalism. Uh, as Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, fam famously wrote uh, a few years ago, we're living in a world now of free market vanilla and North Korea. Um, and so perhaps there's, a, there's barely no part of the world now that's not uh, touched uh, by neoliberalism. But I think this is hardly an adequate uh, way of thinking about its presence to suggest uh, this sort of blanket coverage. Because not so long ago, the map looked like this. Uh, if you remember, the immediate weeks and months after the Wall Street crash of 2008, uh, the death rights of neoliberalism were read by many prominent figures uh, on the left. Naomi Klein, Eric Hobsbawm, Joseph Stiglitz, all were writing in, the, in September, October 2008, that this was the death of neoliberalism, the Wall Street crash. And they saw in that spectacular failure of financial uh, misregulation and deregulation, uh, the end of that neoliberal era, which they described as a kind of Berlin Wall moment for neoliberalism uh, itself. You even had mainstream politicians starting to use the word. Uh, Sarkozy, uh, Kevin Rudd in Australia, they uh, joined the chorus to suggest in 2008 that we're about to enter a post-neoliberal world when there was a return of the state, as if the state had ever disappeared, if that wasn't part of the neoliberal uh, project. Um, and so there was a moment after the Wall Street crash that neoliberalism was declared dead. I want to suggest that perhaps that was an occasion where neoliberalism lost another of its nine lives uh, but it's still got a few to go, uh, and it can, has actually demonstrated a capacity to thrive in those kinds of crisis conditions. After 2008, uh, remember how quickly what started off as a banking crisis was rapidly re-narrated into a crisis of and for the social state. We quickly had accounts that the crisis itself was even caused by the bloated social state, as if it was retired school teachers in Wisconsin that had pushed uh, the economy over. If you watch Fo Fox News, that's pretty much the account uh, that you've been fed now for years. But what began as a banking crisis quickly was transformed into a crisis for the state. And the period of austerity that was encountered in many parts of the world uh, represents a kind of fiscal version of there is no alternative. Uh, extremely austere, joyless form of market rule. Now le neoliberal politicians don't present, pretend, as Thatcher and Reagan did, that the future looks brighter and we're going to get to this sunlit uh, hilltop eventually. Uh, it's now, it's going to be very painful for a very long time, but we have no alternative. Uh, you know, so this austerity moment after, after 2008 uh, is a particularly tough uh, period of neoliberal politics, another rejuvenated uh, form. And we've seen new kinds of structural adjustment practiced in places like Greece, Detroit, and many others uh, since this time. Very quickly, after the 2008 crash, even moderate proposals like Tobin taxes were being ruled out as completely ideologically and politically unacceptable, not least by the Obama administration itself. So uh, what looked like a serious crisis was quickly 
became a sort of course correction uh, and a nastier neoliberalism in some respects uh, followed. So that image that 2008 might have represented a kind of Berlin Wall moment for neoliberalism itself, I think, tells us something about how it actually exists. And I want to raise three objections to the way in which neoliberalism was talked about uh, by Naomi Klein, uh, Hobbes Baum, Stiglitz, and others at the time. Firstly, uh, the idea that that was a singular kind of crash invokes the idea that uh, neoliberalism exists as a singular, total, monolithic system. Um, when in fact, what it had done by that time was deeply entrench itself into various political systems around the world. It didn't exist in that singular form. It couldn't collapse in the way that, say, Eastern German state socialism suddenly collapsed uh, because it didn't exist as that singular monolith. So that's not like a Berlin Wall moment in that respect. Secondly, if we think about that metaphor, we should ask ourselves what was and what is on the other side of the wall. When the Berlin Wall fell in the late 90s, um, what was on the other side of the wall was an expansive capitalist project ready to occupy the territory uh, uh, vacated by the failing project of state socialism in Eastern Europe. What was on the other side of the wall in 2008 when neoliberalism fumbled and entered one of its crisis moments? There was no systemic alternative uh, to the neoliberal project. There was a disparate series of uh, alternatives talked about on the left, but nothing particularly coherent. Uh, the most we got in the mainstream conversation was a kind of warmed over neo-Keynesianism. So there was an enormous vacuum on the other side of the wall in 2008, in other words. Uh, no serious ideological competitor. And so not surprisingly, neoliberal, neoliberalism reoccupied the territory itself. And so we should also ask, in re reflecting on that metaphor, whether, wall, whether a wall really separates neoliberalism uh, from its others. I would suggest uh, that it doesn't. And in fact, we're looking at this complex intermingling of neoliberalism and various other kinds of projects. And so the lesson of 2008, I think, is that neoliberalism is, is this adaptive creature of crisis, uh, which will continue on a, a kind of adaptive path unless it meets uh, oppositional forces that really stop and uh, transform it. And so it's in this sense we can think about neoliberalism since 2008 as a sort of undead uh, ideology. As the geographer Neil Smith wrote uh, in the wake of the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, neoliberalism at that time appeared to be dead but still dominant. Um, or as my uh, account of it at that time was, uh, it, we were entering a period of zombie uh, governance. Uh, zombie governance, neither dead nor alive, uh, but recognizing uh, a failure of intellectual and moral leadership within the neoliberal project itself, but its tenacity as a crisis-driven mode of governance. Now think about the zombie. The zombie is dead from the neck up, but the arms and the legs continue to move, uh, and it goes on almost on autopilot towards the warm-blooded parts of the social universe and throttles the life out, life out of them. I think that is how neoliberalism continues to act. It, there's been a massive failure of its mental capacities, its capacities to be rationalized through Chicago school economics, or its capacity to exert moral leadership politically, but at the same time it exists in this kind of undead uh, form. It's been reanim reanimated by a sort of technocratic uh, muscle memory. Uh, that's uh, pretty much how the austerity uh, governance programs have worked. A deep instincts of self-preservation and spasmodic bursts of social violence. And it continues to be aligned with the primary circuits of corporate financial and political power in the world. It's very convenient to reanimate the project for those dominant uh, interests. And it's been reinforced by global conditions of overaccumulation, public austerity, 
indebtedness, beggar thy neighbor com uh, competition, and so forth. So here we are again after 2008, apparently in this kind of blanket uh, uh, total pattern of neoliberalism. But how do we uh, explain and counter this uh, complexity? This is where I want to get a little bit uh, technical, but to advance the argument that neoliberalism is hegemonic, yet at the same time grafts itself onto other state and social projects. And I'll do this with the assistance of the cultural theorist Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall said the term neoliberal is not a satisfactory one. Intellectual critics say the term lumps together too many things to merit a single identity. It's reductive, sacrifice and attention to internal complexities and geo-historical geo uh, specificity. However, there are enough common features to warrant giving it a provisional and conceptual identity. Furthermore, naming neoliberalism is politically necessary to give resistance content and focus. And Stuart Hall uh, never made his peace with the concept of neoliberalism, it's fair to say. He wrestled with it uh, throughout his life, um, but also never found an adequate replacement for it. In, his argument was that it signified an ideological, political space that kind of had to be problematized and worried a way out. Uh, and that if we just did away with it because it was kind of academically unsatisfactory, uh, we'd be losing something in our politics. And I, I absolutely agree with that. And so for Hall, neoliberalism became hegemonic, uh, more, than, more than simply dominant, but actually hegemonic. But he, following Raymond Williams and others, insisted that hegemony is never a completed project. It's a process, not a state of being, uh, which has constantly to be worked on, maintained, renewed, revised. In ambition, depth, degree of break with the past, impact on the common sense, neoliberalism does constitute a hegemonic uh, project. And we need to remember then that what hegemony means after Gramsci, Raymond Williams and others, uh, it depends for its hold not simply on its expression of the interests of a ruling class, but also on its acceptance as normal reality or common sense by those who are subordinated to it. It refers to the governance of normalization. He hegemony is what has become normal and common sense the default position. I think this is how neoliberalism exists despite its fragility and contradiction, and despite its partiality. It's nevertheless got this uh, indexi indexical quality uh, to it. It frames the terrain uh, that ideas and conflicts occupy. It doesn't prescribe uh, the content of those, but it predisposes some forms of action and direction. But again, to echo to at all, it is never a completed project. Hegemony is a process, not a state of being. So it's this rolling, emergent condition. Uh, I think this is precisely how neoliberalism exists. So I, I, I would connect that to a way of understanding neoliberalism uh, not as a uh, state or a condition in which we live, but as a rolling transformative process. That's why uh, those of us in my uh, neck of the academic woods refer to it as neoliberalization, uh, to turn it into a process, to think about it as a process of change, not a static uh, order. And so therefore, we need to think about how neoliberalism then is engaged in projects of creative destruction as part of its very uh, nature. It's both reactionary and proactive. It attacks, rolls back certain forms of government and state and social life that, to which it, it is antithetical, but also it makes new forms of governance and politics itself. It's both destructive and creative. It invokes, uh, to echo Karl Polanyi, a stark uh, utopia. It's a utopian vision of a world of perfect freedoms, perfect markets, and so on. Entirely utopian vision. And so if there's any, if there's a bit of good news in my otherwise bleak analysis here, uh, it's that we can never live in the world that the neoliberals uh, imagine, the world of perfect freedoms uh, and perfect markets. So we'll never actually get to that destination. Uh, but 
they'll continue to do enormous damage uh, to the social fabric and to governmental systems and so on, trying to get to that destination. So it's utopian in that sense. It invokes a direction of change, not an end point. And Hayek himself recognized this. Utopia, he said, like ideology, is a bad word today. Uh, it's true that most utopias aim at radically redesigning society and suffer from internal contradictions that make their realization impossible. But an ideal picture of society, which may not be wholly achievable, or a guiding conception of the overall order to be aimed at, is nevertheless not only an indispensable precondition for any rational policy, it's also the chief contribution that science, his kind of science, uh, can make to the solutions and problems of practical uh, policy. So Hayek's vision was this kind of utopian uh, view of a free society as a kind of compass for neoliberal reformers. Even while he recognizes that we won't ever arrive there, they do have a compass. And having a compass is important for political action. It means that neoliberals know when they are on or off course. They're frequently off course, uh, but they also know what a proper course ought to look like. And so that's how a utopian ideology uh, works. So if neoliberalism is kind of made up of this kind of utopian vision, yet a more kind of messy uh, reality, we have to recognize that it exists in a whole series of mongrel uh, mixed uh, formations. There's no simple transition going on towards a purer form of neoliberalism. It's not that it was messy in the past and will get purer in the future. It's not that it was pure in the past, the past and now is getting more complex. It just exists in this complex mongrel formation as its only possible mode of existence. So this means, in other words, that neoliberalism exists through a series of unhappy marriages. It's always cohabiting with another partner that it seeks to dominate. Uh, and that means, that means a number of things. It means there are always other things going on than neoliberalism. There is a dynamic of neoliberalization at work in many contexts, but there are always other social and political dynamics at work in those contexts. It can never monopolize, in other words, the social field. And I think this is extremely important to recognize um, uh, as we contemplate how it possibly could fail. So this means then that hybridity, mixing, and uneven geographical development are normal conditions of how neoliberalism exists. We're not moving towards a condition of completely uniform neoliberalism. That would be impossible. But what we have is a series of restructuring projects in multiple sites that refer to and uh, gather some strength from one another. Neoliberalism is more than the sum of its diverse parts in other words, but it only exists in diverse parts. And crises exist for neoliberalism as crucibles for its constant reconstruction. It's constantly remade through crises, many of which now are of its own making. Um, so crises are not problems in a sense for neoliberalism, they are part of its rolling order. In some respects, the project was born in crisis uh, through the systemic crisis of Keynesianism and the welfare state uh, starting in the 60s and 70s. It was drafted as a kind of critique of that kind of Keynesian welfareist order of the post-war world. That's what Milton Friedman and Hayek and others were doing in the Mont Pelerin Society where they were meeting from the late 1940s. They were a small group of conservative opponents to the direction of travel of much of the, what we called at the time, advanced capitalist nations, and they essentially had a critique of Keynesianism that was uh, seeking a, a, an opportunity for uh, being applied. Um, now, Hayek himself reti retired in the 1960s, depressed, thinking that he'd wasted his entire life and the world was trending towards some form of state socialism and uh, it had been a waste of time. He didn't see the crisis of the 1970s coming and the opportunity to use this critique of Keynesianism uh, to achieve political change. So there's nothing guaranteed about neoliberalism's rise. It was conjuncturally valuable at a moment of crisis in the 1970s. 
and it's been remade through a series of crises uh, ever since. So this means that neoliberalism as a project is never complete, but also it's not completable. Uh, it cannot ever be a finished uh, project. And it's what I would prefer to think of as an ethos or a pattern of restructuring. It's about neoliberalism defines the transformation project, not the condition that we're all going to live in. So it's not a description of the ism or the world. It's a description of the process of change. And that process of change simply isn't about moving towards a, sim a smaller state. It absolutely is not simply about that. It's about an attack on the social and redistributive state uh, and often involves an expansion of the repressive uh, disciplining state uh, as a result. Uh, Milton Friedman went to his grave uh, uh, complaining about the fact that they'd never been able to shrink the overall size of the state. Uh, yeah, that proved impossible uh, for neoliberal reformers. Uh, as a share of GDP, the size of the states has remained relatively large. It's what the state does which has changed. And as Hayek said, to quote Hayek, it is the character rather than the volume of government that is important. It's what the state does, not its overall size. And that's where I think neoliberalism has had a huge effect as a, a kind of transformative uh, project. Another thing to say about the neoliberal project is it's associated with endemic uh, policy failure. Most of the policies associated with the neoliberal repertoire tend to fail, uh, but I would argue they fail they lean into uh, their own failures. They fail in a forward direction. Uh, they fail towards new rounds of solutions within tight ideological uh, parameters. So what, how neoliberalism works as an ideology is solutions to crises are sought within a narrow space. There's a constrained uh, solution space. This is what neoliberals themselves call uh, governance, uh, but as, essentially that is a, a recognition of the way that they've had to improvise their way through multiple policy failures. Think about the transformations from simple privatization to the complex world of public-private partnerships. Uh, the original thinking in the 1980s was that privatization would do it. You just roll back the state, as Thatcher said, and the animal spirits of capitalism would fill the space, markets would deliver, and then the state could happily shrink. Bullshit. Uh, <laughs> What those deregulations and privatizations did was create new policy problems which required a construction of a new apparatus for overseeing privatized spaces like the privatized trains, the privatized uh, utilities, and so on. And so you've got new modes of governance bolted onto ill working market solutions. That's how neoliberalism fails forward. It, it, constantly and creates problems, then it finds solutions within a narrow space. Think about the transitions from structural adjustment to so-called good governance in the global south. Uh, think about the shifts in financial regulation from straightforward uh, deregulation to light touch forms of regulation. Think about welfare policy, the shift from straightforward welfare cuts to the production of new kinds of welfare or active social policy, uh, workfare and so on, that try to produce new kinds of market subjects who will accept contingent work uh, due to the lack of alternatives. So the first waves of neoliberal solutions nearly all failed, and now we're on the third or fourth generation of those. This is actually how it works as a project. So it's the neoliberalism today is very different to its early 1980s form, and it will continue to evolve as a kind of adaptable uh, project. It was, as Hayek said, a flexible credo, not a fixed template. It isn't about a fixed policy repertoire handed down from Mont Pelerin in tablets of stone and observed absolutely literally in every place. It's this improvised experimental uh, project within ideological parameters. So I'm going to move to a, to a conclusion by just asking a couple of things about where neoliberalism is now in that kind of uh, multipolar uh, world. Um, and one of the questions is what we make of the ongoing road traffic accident uh, on the both sides of the Atlantic under these two uh, 
administrations. Um, arguably, I think it's better to think of Trump and May, the Trump and May administrations as symptoms uh, rather than causes of part of the problems that the, uh, the UK and the US are in. Uh, but what are they symptoms of? Uh, I think they're partly symptoms of the failure uh, from the top down of conservative party political management. So we should be clear about that. It's chronic mismanagement of conservative party structures that's part of the problem here. That's what gave Britain the Brexit vote. That's what produces the kind of primary politics in the United States and the kind of feverish uh, mood of the Tea Party and so on uh, that makes it impossible to run as an establishment uh, Republican uh, anymore. In some respect, conservative parties have rotted from the head down in that kind of zombie fashion as well. They've got a complete uh, failure of leadership inside the party. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it also reflects, if we to reflect on uh, the causes of May and Trump, a willingness of factions in those conservative parties to initiate, exploit, and amplify cultural resentments, scapegoating politics, and so on, around the stresses of na late neoliberal conditions. Those are fermented by social geographies uh, of abandonment and so on in the parts of the country in the US and the UK that have been left uh, behind, where endemic economic insecurities have been inflamed by you know, nationalist, racist, anti-immigrant cultural politics. So I think we kind of can see how that long fermenting series of problems have created a, a kind of petri dish for uh, exploitation in certain uh, forms of conservative politics. But we also have to recognize that the rise, or maybe that the rise is not the war, the presence of Trump and May is a re reflects a reciprocal failure on the part of Democratic and Labour parties in Britain and the United States, especially their failure, complete failure, to articulate an alternative economic vision, uh, which I think certain parts of their traditional electorate uh, long woken up to. If you're in the abandoned parts of uh, Britain and the United States, you would see that Hillary Clinton was not going to do uh, much for you. Uh, there's not much in the kind of Democratic uh, Party's uh, project for, for those parts of the country. The fact that Clinton didn't visit Wisconsin and, and so forth is just a reflection of the kind of assumption uh, that uh, business as usual would be enough. And in the Brexit vote, I think it's also the case uh, that um, there was a rejection of the sort of business as usual that was on offer and a willingness just to try something wildly different uh, because of you know, frustration with the existing uh, diet of, of policy solutions. So this kind of inchoate rage, uh, anger, dissatisfaction, and so on, I think has partly propelled uh, the conditions uh, in which Trump and May now operate. And so in some respects, I would say this is a, a classic example of zombie uh, governance, a volatile cocktail of nationalism, racism, and a sort of ideologically unmoored process of flailing around in the policy realm. A chaotic policy agenda with strong undercurrents of hyper neoliberalization, also strong forms of possible course correction on issues like free trade and, uh, and open boundaries and so on. So this is the flexible credo of neoliberalism in its crisis uh, mode. As uh, Lord Keynes wrote to Hayek when he read Hayek's Road to Serfdom in 1944, this is all jolly interesting, uh, but you people don't know where to draw the line. Uh, and I think that observation about the neoliberal project is extremely uh, revealing. Uh, there was no stopping point. There was no point when, okay, that's about enough. <laughs> we'll stop there. We've deregulated enough. Now we know we've hit the sweet spot. It tends to, lemming-like, keep rushing off the next cliff uh, rushing off the next into the next crisis and so on. There is no uh, stopping point in this kind of transformative politics. It lends itself to crises repeatedly. <coughs> next, very different kind of setting, what's going on uh, in China. Uh, we've just had announced at the Chinese Communist Party's Congress uh, last month uh, that um, 
China will be moving towards socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new era as the definition of the uh, ideological project of China. This reflects a form of socialist modernization while retaining opening up to the global market as the basic policy of the country. So what's this hybrid of socialism and neoliberalization uh, that we see in China? Uh, Deng, when he op began to open up China in the late 1970s, said that China was going to be crossing the river by feeling for stones. Uh, he'd never fully articulated what was on the other side of the river. Uh, that's part of the double speak of the Chinese Communist Party. But this sense of an experimental attempt to cross a river by moving carefully from one step to another, I think characterizes how China has moved to embrace aspects of the neoliberal agenda alongside uh, a, a continuing party state systems. So we've got markets continuing to play a decisive role in China's advance to socialism, apparently, with Chinese characteristics. So neoliberalism exists both in China and in May's and Trump's United States. It's an articulation of those and many other uh, different uh, conjunctures. One of the things that's very interesting about China at the present time is that they've uh, particularly uh, set out to um, ban the term uh, neoliberalism as a, uh, as a Western uh, conceit. Uh, document number nine, which was leaked from the, uh, from the Communist Party headquarters a few years ago, is a communique on the current state of the ideological sphere and said this about neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism advocates unrestrained economic liberalization, complete privatization, and total marketization, and it imposes any kind of interference or regulation by the state. Western countries led by the United States carry out their neoliberal agendas under the guise of globalization, visiting catastrophic consequences upon Latin America, the Soviet Union, and Eastern Europe. So far, not bad as a description, anyway. Uh, and have also dragged themselves into the international financial crisis from which they have yet to recover. Uh, so the Chinese are enjoying this, I think it's fair to say. Um, <laughs> But, but think about what this means. Uh, it's important ideologically for the Chinese Communist Party to present neoliberalism on the outside. Uh, it doesn't exist on the inside of the Chinese Communist Party project. It's clearly on the outside. It's a, it's a Western ideological dysfunction. And as the party now uh, seeks to set up what is called new style think tanks with Chinese characteristics, it's now trying to find a way through this kind of ideological forest towards eventually its own form of socialism uh, with neoliberal and Chinese uh, characteristics. Finally, the Adam Smith Institute, uh, one of the original uh, neoliberal think tanks based in London, have themselves recently decided, just last year, uh, that they're going to come out as neoliberals. Having refused to use this term uh, for decades, uh, they now decided it actually is the best term uh, to describe what they're actually doing. And as, as it were from the horse's mouth, uh, this is what um, uh, they say neoliberalism is, it is. And they insist that nothing has changed about what we believe in the conservative free market think tanks, or the approach we take. But neoliberal is a clearer label for what we believe and do than any others that are available. For us, the world neoliberal means that we're pro-markets, pro-property rights, pro-growth, individualistic, empirical, and open-minded, globalist in outlook, optimistic about the future, and focused on changing the world for the better. Um, so after years of disowning this critic's term then, it seems like some of the actually existing neoliberals are now prepared uh, to own the term. But I think this simply illustrates the point that yeah, it's not clear yet, where, now even, where ne neoliberalism lives, who, believe, who assigns themselves to it and, and so forth. It remains a complex, contested term. So where is neoliberalism now? Let me wrap up by making a few points uh, uh, that summarize aspects of the argument. Firstly, I believe it is a hegemonic pattern, even though it is parasitic in its own way. It's grafted onto other social and state systems as varied as the Chinese Communist Party, the United States federal government, and, and so on. So it exists not in blanket form, but in multiple articulations. 
It's dogged by persistent policy failure, but also it's dogged in its tenacious hold on elite politics. This all said, it faces a deepening uh, legitimacy crisis, as, and I think Justin Trudeau is uh, a, a very interesting manifestation of the complexities of kind of managing uh, the neoliberal uh, third way project in, in, the, in the present uh, time. So, it, but it remains hegemonic, dead but dominant. Its political grip remains, but it has lost a lot of the intellectual and moral credibility such that it had, or at least claimed, in the 80s and 90s. Neoliberalism now exists in a desert of its own making, having eroded alternatives, uh, but yet unable to establish a monopoly in its own terms. And so that's the uh, ideological field in which it currently exists. To invoke Karl Polanyi once more, uh, we will see in late neoliberal politics a whole series of double movements as Polanyi described them. For Polanyi, double movements were reflected the liability of markets to fail and overflow. So marketization for Polanyi would always produce uh, problems, market failures and so on, and various forms of social and political response and counter movement. What was critical about Polanyi's observation, though, was that the re social responses to market failure were not predictable in terms of their form. They could include fascism, they could include welfare state, they could include many progressive and regressive responses. So we know markets will lead to crisis. What we don't know is the political content of uh, the response to that crisis. And so I think that also is a, a moment where we can reflect on the consequences of the diverse responses to late neoliberal crises, which include these new nationalisms, new racist movements, as well as new progressive movements uh, on the left. So to deal with this complex situation of where neoliberalism is, we have to recognize that a multi-front uh, struggle is necessary. There is no single thread to pull apart the entrenched neoliberal uh, hegemony of today. Uh, it will not disappear with a big bang. Um, when I was asked many years ago uh, what would lead to the ultimate failure of neoliberalism, I used to say, with some confidence, that if we had a financial crisis that hit New York, that would be it. <laughs> now, now we've seen that. We know that's not it. Uh, because neoliberalism doesn't only live in Wall Street, it also lives in Beijing and many other parts of the world in those complex forms of cohabitation. So it can fail in one place, it can fail in ten places. Uh, but also it can be kind of reproduced in this complex, uh, multi-centric way. So if neoliberalism is not going to die uh, you know, with, through a, with a stake through the heart in some final confrontation, David and Goliath style, how will it disappear? I think it's more likely to be exhausted, outflanked, and exceeded. Because remember, it always has to exist with its others. Uh, there are always alternatives to neoliberalism co-present with it in every single place it's ever existed. So it never completely occupies the social sphere. It has to live with its others. Those other movements can lead to all kinds of transformations. And I think that's uh, pretty much uh, how we could expect neoliberalism eventually to fail, not in a spectacular big bang, but in a whimper and being exceeded, outflanked, and overtaken by a, any number of alternative uh, visions, some of them regressive, conservative, other, others hopefully progressive. So what will it take to outflank neoliberalism then? It will take new rules of the game globally, especially concerning uh, finance, climate change, uh, the dull compulsion of competitive relations, the crisis of care, and many other phenomena you will need global or transnational rules of the game to enable uh, its uh, being exceeded in that respect. We'll need new beachheads for progressive uh, government at the regional, provincial, and national level. Uh, we, do, we will need uh, those kinds of uh, beachheads. And we'll need a raft of new experiments at the local level, new models, new demonstration projects, and so on. So a multi-scalar uh, kind of project. And there will be, of course, other crises. Other crises where there'll be times to act uh, decisively. 
Crises are times when uh, the game-changing kinds of actions can be enacted. And I'm going to end with an observation on that from Milton Friedman himself. His words at the beginning of the Reagan uh, administration when he made this comment. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, uh, speaking as a conservative intellectual, to develop alternatives to existing policies to keep them alive and available until the political impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, uh, maybe we could take just a couple of questions here and uh, then we'll uh, uh, try to finish up by 1.30 or so. So hand just over here first if uh, someone can. And again, look for some gender balance here if I can find... Come on, it's got to be a, ah, uh, Annika, I'm going to see if there's someone else. You've had your chance many times today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I see a hand just over here. Did you want to ask questions or? Okay, we'll take the first question here anyway. Uh, thank you for the thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm going to ask one, uh, and it has to do with the, the map that you showed for 2008, where like there was no neoliberalism and it was in crisis, and you said like there was the financial crisis uh, that showed the the, the weak the, the weak spots of neoliberalism. But it was not only that; there were all there were also like alternatives that were being developed in Latin America, in Asia, uh, and those alternatives were showing that it's possible to 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 grow economically. Like the the crisis was was bad in the states. But those years were actually really good for Brazil and from, uh, um, for other countries, right? So yep. in a way, the crisis was very localized uh, in here, North yep. America. Yep. Yep. So the issue is, what, like, all, many of those projects failed uh, or were weakened. And I wanted to, to know like, uh, if you want to comment a little bit on why the alternatives that were being developed have not been able to 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 get to gather more momentum, mm -hmm. right? To counterbalance mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the the taking over of neoliberalism over the, the spaces that were emptied. Should we take a couple of them? Last call for a hand here, Annika. Do you still want to ask the question? Okay, you got it. I am so glad you came to Edmonton because you bring light to a desperate situation. And I was waiting for you to use the word, the concept, fascism. And it didn't come out until the very end that you used fascism. Because how, you know, how can we uh, historically then explain um, neoliberalism if we do not use that concept, fascism. <clears throat> Are you now saying, maybe, that neoliberalism is a much better keyword than fascism? Okay. Okay, great. Huge questions. Um, uh, my, the point about fascism first is, um, uh, I think my issue there is to, to underline the fact that neoliberalism can coexist with fascism and it can coexist with social democracy and it can coexist with uh, state socialism and it can coexist with many other things. So we have to think about its capacity to inhabit those multiple spaces simultaneously. Um, and again, to the Polanyian point, uh, of counter movements against uh, excessive liberalization uh, will have wildly varying political content. So Polanyi's point was that the struggles around alternatives to markets and marketization and excessive liberalization would always be political struggles, never preordained. Some of them will veer badly right, others might move to the left. It's all about politics. Uh, and so I think even though there's a kind of, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, Gramsci's point about uh, pessimism of the will and uh, pessimism of the uh, 
uh, the op to pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I say I, I work mainly in the pessimism of the intellect department, uh, sort of looking at the nature of the beast itself. Uh, but the critical question is that these futures are always going to be political made, politically made. There is no preordained answer to the questions of how these contradictions roll out. Yet there are uh, kind of well known grooves that we'll tend to slip into in the, in the wake of crises. So the current dominant face of neoliberalization, I would say, would be its marriage with authoritarian systems generally. That is the, if we look at, across the global picture, it's a new articulation of neoliberalism and authoritarian or semi-fascist uh, modes of governance. Uh, but it can also exist in many other formations. Uh, whether just in Trudeau's version of warmed over uh, third way, progressive neoliberalism is, has got any longer term prospects. I think we, we need to look at all those species together, uh, I would say. In terms of Latin America, uh, I would have loved to spend more time on that question because I think it's absolutely uh, vital. Uh, the pink tide across Latin America, of course, did provide uh, lots of potential visions of the future, and I think many models that will continue to shape political projects far beyond uh, Latin America. Uh, a recent book of mine, Fast Policy, was mainly focused on Latin America, and we were making the argument in that book uh, that we don't necessarily know where processes of neoliberal or political transformation will lead. Uh, James Ferguson, the anthropologist from Stanford, makes a similar point uh, that we could be living on a terrain largely shaped by neoliberalism and there could still be alternative pathways that will op open up. What he calls progressive arts of governance can be constructed even in the crucible of neoliberal transformation. So for this reason, uh, I find lots of interesting possibilities, even in reformist programs uh, like Bolsa Familia and the conditional cash transfers across Latin America, because I think they open up pathways to uh, alternative forms of basic income experimentation and so on globally uh, that will transcend that moment. In, in Latin American politics, the crucible for those experiments in welfare reform, uh, which might have a much wider salience in this century, uh, that existed there. They, in some respects, were products of um, neoliberal experimentation in themselves, uh, but don't necessarily need to be entirely constrained by that, um, that those origins. Um, so I think we need kind of conjunctural analysis of, of the neoliberal and other projects all of the time, uh, and the places where we look for progressive inspiration will continue to vary. What's critical, though, I think, um, is that, especially for the left, is that we uh, try to extend our behind horizons beyond the local. Uh, I'm one of the people who's rather skeptical about uh, left localism as an end in itself, which I think is a, a kind of product of uh, the weakened position of the left at the present time. We have to think beyond uh, the local in lots of ways, we have to think about, uh, while it's important for us to um, uh, have control of our alternative radios and uh, uh, stations and community gardens, uh, we've also got to think about alternative ways of managing the international financial system uh, and so on. Uh, and, of course, controlling the state. The neoliberals fully understand the consequence, the importance of getting control of the state uh, and uh, to turn away from electoral politics, as you see on certain parts of the left is, I, I don't think, uh, productive in that respect. And so uh, I think we can look at the Latin American pink tide moment as a source of inspiration and, a, and the fact that it stands for the possibility of moving the needle significantly in political terms. And we can also understand the crises of those systems in terms of the global conjuncture uh, that they occupied, uh, many of them. Uh, many of those economies dependent on external uh, export markets, which later collapsed and so on. Um, so I think we just need that conjunctural analysis of those systems in order to make sense of political possibilities as well as the, uh, the threats of the moment. I recognize uh, we could probably go on for a lot longer with questions, but I'm also mindful of time here. So I think uh, what I'll do is we're going to finish here right now. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Jamie. We have yeah. a, a small gift of thank appreciation you. for you coming and giving us a really inspiring talk.